Recording is active. Hello, welcome back. Good to see you. Uh, what are you doing here? <laughs> you remember last week's class? How'd that fit with you? <laughs> you don't like it? No? What do you remember about last time? M2. What's M2 do? That is model fit. Model fit. Can you give me more words to describe it? <laughs> model, well, the function returns the RMS, all that <laughs> stuff. I, I, I know what it returns, but yeah. tell me about the statistic. Well, the, I, I, I wanted to know if we could go over that a little bit more, because I got a little, a little lost. OK. Oh, I had a question. Yeah. Um, but I think I can go after it. OK. Anybody want to jump in on M2? Yeah, Vladimir. Yeah, I have a question because last week we saw that the M2 statistic mm -hmm. is helpful to see if the model imply thing that we have is similar to the observed data, but Correct. Not, not in terms of the, of the saturated convenience metrics, but in the first moment and second moment That's right. of the, the, the contingency table. Correct. Right? So my question is that first moment and second moment of, of those uh, contingency tables are taking like reference the reference for those things are the means and variances of the contingency tables no it's just the so remember this in a categorical data contingency table contains all the information that you need yep. right and what we showed last time is there's a really big contingency table the full information contingency table which is the probability a person has any response profile yes okay so that is a joint like a joint distribution if you think about it right because now it's every item when you look at the first moment that's just a contingency table for its single item itself so if a single item is a zero binary item right there's a single probability and its complement in that contingency table that single probability is the mean of that item okay. itself not the mean of all the tables but it's the mean of the item so now what we're talking about it's a really complicated and general way of, of describing what's happening for descriptive statistics for items so single items are means, effectively. The contingency table, the two by, again, let's stay with binary items. If you have the two by two table right here, let's, I can even draw it, I have it right here, right? You have a zero and a one for, let's call this X, and we have a Y over here, a zero and a one. Each one of these four cells has a probability like this, right? Uh, zero, one, right? So, the margin of this table would still also be the probability, the, the marginal probability of one of them, right? Um, but in the contingency table, one of these numbers is really unique, and that is the covariance of the item itself. It's effectively, it's not exactly, the, I guess technically it's not a Pearson covariance, but it's, it's like that, right? All this, this contingency table, from it, we can derive a covariance, we could derive a correlation, we could derive a whole bunch, but this is the actual number that starts with all of those. So when M2 talks about fit to uh, the margins in addition to the, the, the two-way tables or the second moment, it's looking at fit to those direct statistics that we can calculate that are the statistics, not the summaries or not other transformations of them that we're more used to. That, does that yeah, answer? Yes. And those things are calculated item per item, or do we have some kind of summaries? They are calculated. Uh, well, these are summary statistics, first of all, right? They are, oh, well, yes. but um, they are calculated. They are calculated for each item and then each pair of items itself. Okay, so that's related to these contingency tables, uh, not to the response pattern. That's right. Well, okay. yeah, I mean, the, so in that um, that image I showed you from the paper, yeah, the, the matrix, right? Where the matrix was, yes, yeah. that sort of was the link between them. See if I can find it real quick. This one right here. What this is telling you is, if you have the full data, the full probabilities from all the response patterns, with a design matrix, that's what this thing is. They called it the M matrix. You can easily arrive at each of the the moments that you need. Right. So this right here, this is the first moment, but only for the first item. Second item, the third item. This is the first the items one and two, one and three, and two and three, right? So this design matrix sort of extracts it from the response profile. Great. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so let me just, before you ask a question, let me just get back to what you asked. You know M2 gives you, there's a function, 
Here's how we would describe it. M2 is a fit measure to two-way tables, or one and two-way tables. That's where the two in M2 comes from. So it's what we would call a limited information fit measure, meaning you can't assess whether it fits the data absolutely. That's what's required in the far right column. That far right column would be absolute fit. But that is, why is that impossible? Do you remember? Anybody? Sparse data, right? We'll just never have enough, we will never, just even for a regular size assessment, we could never have enough data on Earth to do that. I was just speaking of Earth. This is a thought experiment for you. I just saw a clip with Neil deGrasse Tyson, who um, was saying, you know, he read somewhere that there were, in, in the history of humanity, there may have been some hundred billion people, right, alive. You think about some of the assessments that we build, like some of the licensure ones that are really long. We would have had enough data in the history of humanity to go and check the fit of it, right? That's what that's saying. Uh, he was saying it in the context of what's the, the likelihood. You think of all the, the DNA that's in our body and there's sort of permutations for it. What's the likelihood two people in the history of humanity at random have the same DNA with that are, were not identical twins? It's infinitesimally small also for that reason. It's likewise with this. So. Anyway, this is a limited information statistic. The other thing I want to add to it, it's called M2, again, because it fits the marginal and two-way tables. But that doesn't, you don't have to stop there. You could make an M3, right? In, in the case of this small example, there's only three items. So it's not like, you know, this is, this is just an example. But you could do M3, right? You could do M4, right? You could do all sorts of different Ms, whatever you want. But that's the thing. The more that you get, you get approximate fit to two-way two tables. The question it doesn't answer is, does it really fit the data at two? If it fits two-way tables, is it good enough, close enough to the data? I'm not familiar with the research in this area. Maybe someone's looked at that. But if not, there's a topic for you. Yes, Dave. Um, don't, like, if you, if this is not really just whatever, but is this related to the Z-matrix? No, OK. If you're the random effects, not at all. Not at all. Okay. Nope. And the M2 is not a moment two. It's the two-way table. Yeah, okay. M is the statistic name. A two would be the, the two way, the, denoting its two way tables and okay. stuff. That's good. Had you heard of M2 before this class? Maybe a tiny bit. Anyway, I think so. Fit, the neat thing with this, if you go look, again, that introduction of the paper I gave you sort of highlighted how fit was done in IRT many times before. Like this is light years ahead of where we were at in the 80s, mainly because we're not now, um, a lot of the fit you saw in IRT was, is a 2PL fit or does a 3PL fit? Do I need to go and plot? I'm going to output theta. I'm going to go plot averages with it. The problem with that is the first sentence. Don't output theta. Theta doesn't exist, right? So if you're outputting it as a single point estimate, you totally forgot all the error that goes with it which is, uh, I think, a common phenomenon in the educational measurement field. We sort of forget theta has error, um, but it's important. And if you look at the FIT statistic from the 80s under the lens that you see, I wouldn't say in this paper, but some of this and Orlando's work right before it in the early 2000s, you'll see that FIT statistics in the 80s were sort of just like almost tautological, almost like the argument I was making with you, Annette, about validity. But like it fits because of course it fits because you're just summarizing what things that did with data already, which is once you once you account for the error in theta. Anyway, I'm gonna sneeze. Excuse me. Maybe. Sorry. <laughs> All right. It's the cat that you know. You open the door and it's like, yeah, I thought about going out, but maybe not. It's like, nope, shut the door. I just shut the door on sneezing. You know that? Do you have cats that do that? No, they just pull for it. Oh, well, yours do maybe. I, I can't stand, if you're going to have a cat, have a decisive one, like that. <laughs> All right. Uh, other questions? How's class going? Yeah, Alfonso. Yeah, so I think maybe you answered it, um, but Vladimir asked this. But my question was, does having an like, item fit for all items then apply like, you have like, global fit? That is what the, that's why M2 exists, okay. right? So in theory, we don't, we could do this for every item now. Right? We don't have to calculate a global fit measure. In fact, if you think about it, again, when we go to that two-way two table, like we could observe this in data, and then we can go and provide it based on our model. Right? We use the marginal distribution of our model. We can always compare observed versus expected. Where it becomes 
The global fit issue is the need for M2. But from a local fit perspective, where we only want to see if a pair of items is misfitting, we could get that already. And actually, in M plus, prior to M2 even being a thing, they have an output option called Tech 10. And it gives you all the two-way, one univariate, the, the marginal single variable tables, and the expected values from the model. And it will do the two-way tables and the expected, and it'll calculate chi-squares for each one itself. So it's trying to give you fit for each. The only problem with it is the aggregate summary. It gives you a total, but that distribution of that total was unknown. That's where the M2 starts to make a difference. Does that answer your question? All right. Yeah, M2 is pretty good stuff. Pretty good fit. All right. Anybody else? Questions, comments? In M plus, um, the way that these squares mean at variance, that's weird. Yeah. Um, is that related? We'll see, talk about that next week. Okay. It's related not to model fit. It's related in that it's limited information estimation. Oh, so this is, this is not estimation. This is just... This is thing. fitting model to the data. Okay. Um, what I mean by that is, again, this is next week's lecture, which probably could be a whole semester. So I've got to figure out how to, like, hit the high points and get moving. But... Um, we're going to find next week that when we have a, a, just a handful of dimensions, like you have in your data for your homeworks, to estimate a, that model, like five dimensions, is n very difficult because of this having to integrate across numerically across those dimensions to get the estimate. So the re one of the remedies to that is to not have to, you can, you can express, um, well, anyway, stay tuned for next week. I'll just leave it there. I'm going to give next week's lecture now. I'm already writing it. I'm like, no, forget it. I'm going to stop there. All right? But remember, limited information. When you hear limited information, you're not thinking the raw data. You don't see, like, this contingency table itself, this is a summary. Right? It's, it's a count, but it's not individual data points. So anything limited information is that, that summary. In the context of model fit, like M2, it's looking at summaries of certain two or three way tables, one way, two way, three way tables. In the case of estimation, we're going to take those summaries and use those as our data in a likelihood function and build a likelihood estimation function around that. All right. Yeah, next week's going to be super exciting. Although there are, I know there are some of you who, I, I, like when Lisa had her uh, health issues, I was supposed to teach an estimation class, and I heard from some of you who are like disappointed in that. And so I get it. That would have been like the hardest class I ever taught because I don't know how to like make slides and do that. But anyway, all right. Okay, we're going to start. By the way, you'll note I did change. You got my email to change the thing to read. This isn't even an article yet. <laughs> like it hasn't been fully published. So if anyone ever says like, "How old are the papers?" They're not even papers yet. This is a preprint. Actually, it's been accepted. Uh, and Vladimir, you'll note that uh, the first author is from Chile. So, uh, anyway. Psychometric Society was in Chile not too long ago as well. I don't know if you were there. But. Okay. Um, let's dive in. So, it's slides today. I don't have slides today. I actually have, I just stayed with the markdown because I started getting into parts where they didn't fit easily to slides. I'm going to just ask you just a quick question on that. Is that all right, teaching-wise? Do you care if it's markdown or slides? No. Okay, because some of these things, like, you know, like I can, if I'm showing you data, it's going to over, you know, run the page or something like that. That's a problem. All right. Well, then, I think I'm just going to jump into this with uh, GitHub code or VS Code. There we go. All right. There we go. Put this here. Can you see this sufficiently? Is it a good size? OK, then I can flip back with code and everything else. All right. So today, we got through up to this point. Model fit, models. We sort of did the prerequisites. Now we're going to get into the hard reality of multidimensional assessment, which is it's really hard to do. Here's the thought question I want you to think with to start with, though. All right? How long have assessments been around for? Too 
Too long. Okay. Depends on how you define assessment. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about you, but I think thousands of years, right? As some sort of assessment has been. Now, how we, what we do with the assessments has changed, but the process of assessments are there. And then, so the concepts we're talking about are definitely not new. And the concepts of multidimensional assessment are also not new. But here's the question I have for you. If multidimensional assessment isn't new, and we are um, sort of where a lot of our students end up is educational assessment industry, why don't we see a lot of multidimensional assessments in ed measurement? It's kind of like the Fermi paradox. You know that paradox? Like if, uh, if, 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 if you think about the odds that, um, that humans are the only species in the universe, the only intelligent species, right? Like if you look at it, it's highly likely somewhere in because the, the universe is so massive, it's highly likely that there's some other intelligent be the species somewhere in the universe. And yet, if that's the case, where are they? Right? It's like, okay, so we've had multidimensional assessment for years, and people say it's really nice to have multiple bits of information come up from a test, but if we've had it for years, and it's really nice to get that from a test, where are all the multidimensional assessments? They're like the... The multidimensional assessments are like aliens. I can think of a handful of them that exist. Uh, I can think of them in, in other contexts, particularly in personality or um, vocational interests, things like that, you know, things where you might see surveys. But where are multidimensional assessments? What do you think? First of all, have you, am I, is my conjecture even right? Do you see a lot of multidimensional assessments in ed measurement? Well, like the subscore thing. Maybe. Oh, they're subscores. Yeah, there we go. But are those multidimensional assessments? Multi there we go. Yeah. They're not. <laughs> and actually, they're lying with data if you create it from a unidimensional. What's that? Well, a lot of programs I've looked into don't even report subscores because they're not reliable. It's not just they're not reliable, but if you end up like using IRT and you use a unidimensional model for it, and then you use that same model to create subscores, you've just made short, short form scores of the oh. same assessment. So the only differences in them are noise from sample or uh, number of items in each. Uh, we're actually going to cover that at the end of class because I, my in my experience, I had a great experience once having to fight about this with somebody. So just because of that, I'm going to make a class out of it. That's how how like I write my articles too. Oh, I had an argument once, philosophical, of course, and uh, I saw it one way, somebody else saw it differently. So I'm going to write a paper about it and try to study it. And a lot of times I'm wrong. Don't get me wrong, I'll argue the wrong side of things. I don't think I was in the wrong there. But you're right, yes, they are unreliable. In addition to worthless if they come from the same parameters that come from um, unidimensional assessment in general. But yeah, that's the thing. Multidimensional models everywhere. Like when I was in grad school, we, I got into this cognitive diagnosis, which I don't like the word cognitive anymore, because everybody's like, yeah, look, we can get more information from tests. Yeah, great. You know how hard it is to like, have, I've been there, I've, been, I've seen it, I've put, diagnostic models into the world and uh, been lucky enough to like work on them in like different testing programs or everywhere you know how hard it is to get that out the door like and how many obstacles and that's not even talking about it but here's my conjecture there's two reasons one is only the difficulties they're really hard to build a multidimensional assessment the other is these didn't come first right and so when you got a product many of you most of you weren't born when uh, there was the thing called new coke so you, you know the difference in taste between Diet Coke and Coke, right? Diet, you've got Coke Zero, right? Yeah. All right, so Coke Zero and Diet Coke don't taste the same, right? Do you know why that is? You're a Georgian. Coke Zero is meant to taste more like the original Coke, whereas Diet Coke is meant to be a lighter taste. Ah, so I believe the answer is Diet Coke was the formula that Coke changed itself to in the mid-'80s. Now, I was a young kid at the time. But they completely changed how Coke tasted. A formula that had been around for like 100 years at the time. <laughs> and guess what happened? There was a massive revolt. People quit buying Coke. And that what I heard, now I may be wrong about this, but I had a former grad student from Georgia who ended up working at Coke in Atlanta. Um, I think I got it from her, but maybe I didn't. Um, anyway, was that what you taste in Diet Coke is the new Coke recipe that they had changed to. 
but with uh, no sugar, with the, the sugar substitutes. Whereas what you taste in Coke Zero is the original Coke recipe, but with the sugar recipe. <laughs> so that difference in taste. So what I'm saying with this is a tough business decision gets in the way. If you've got a product, let's be honest, if you've got a product that's hot garbage, but you sell a lot of it, you have very little incentive to change the hot garbage, right? Now I'm not saying, I love Coke, right? Coke is like, sort of like, it's like Coke to me, literally. Like, yeah, like it's, yeah, right? Coke is, is the real thing, right? So I get it, um, but like, it's an interesting, like the, the science of it is different than the business of it. And that's, that has ramifications not just for um, whether or not assessment should be multidimensional or not, right? It takes money, everybody needs money to do this, and there's very little incentive if you're in a market that's only unidimensional assessments to do that. Um, and second, um, it takes effort and time to build to, to justify, right? The other ramification for this is interesting is how we teach you in a scientific program. That's a, that's a topic for a different day as well, because if we're teaching you industry stuff, and industry isn't quite with the science, I don't feel like we're doing our job well enough, right? So that's, that's the other conundrum we have. We need to train you to do this stuff in the industry, but we should be training you on the science. But anyway, that's a different topic. So what are the difficulties in estimating or doing multidimensional assessment? Um, I've listed a few that came up off the top of my head, and I'm gonna dive in deeply to this, but we need to talk about statistical identification first. Basically, can we even theoretically estimate parameters of this model? That's what statistical identification is. Then we talk about empirical identification, which would be basically saying, even if we could have statistical identification, do the data even support this type of model? Right? Because we can great create assessment all we want, so particularly those of you who have written items, test items before, you can re write the most beautiful test item and think it's wonderful and well written and well aligned that goes to, like it just doesn't work well when someone reads it and uses it, right? right? That's the, the empirical version of it. And then we get into sort of the nuance of it. There's differing de definitions of dif dimensionality. So when I say it in one context, it may be different than a different context. Um, how many dimensions are in a data set? Oh. <laughs> I know that sounds like a really easy thing, but if you can't define what a dimension is easily, how can you quantify them very well? Right? Uh, there's this thing about latent variable indeterminacy. Have you heard about that before? It shows up in factor analysis, but I'm gonna show it to you in a general context today that's still there as well. And then finally, and this is a segue into next week, was the estimation of models. So I'm gonna do the lecture today, we're gonna discuss the paper, and then we're gonna do a little bit of a coding exercise. The coding exercise that goes with this is gonna be two part. Number one, I figured out how to fix argon to make it a little easier. The problem with packages we're gonna fix that. And number two, I'll help, I'll, if there's time left, to be working on homework, but you can work together on your homeworks. But each of you with different data, and Min, I will, I'm sorry, Shouting, I will talk about your, I will look into your data as well, okay? Okay, let's do this. Statistical identification is the ability to estimate parameters of a model uniquely, <coughs> right? So there's one set of parameters that describe the model. Um, when we talk about this in measurement models, it often starts with this idea that we have a system of unknown equations, system of equations where parameters are the unknowns, and some feature of the data is what's known, uh, and the number of parameters has to be less than the number, the number of unknowns has to be less than the number of knowns, basically. Right? And much of the literature on this will come from factor analysis. So I keep, factor, I keep bringing up factor analysis a lot because we get heavily informed by what we do with the factor analysis world. And it's easier to show. As you saw last week, the model implied distribution for factor analysis, when we talk about the marginal data distribution, there's no integral involved. When there's no integral involved, it makes life a whole lot easier, right? So um, I would tell you that even though it's difficult to show for IRT models, I think you can definitely show it through simulation. And there are people who are much smarter than I who can do the analytic, like derivation for it. But we all have to agree that if you can't estimate parameter model, models of a parameter, pardon me, parameters of a model, God, I'm backwards, parameters of a model, 
then you can't do any other type of stuff with it, right? The first step to doing anything is parameters of model, right? Okay. But it's not sufficient, right? You got to be able to estimate things and then you got to have the data support them. So this first part is how do we tell that we're able to estimate things? So you've heard me talk about this before, particularly if you took my Bayes class. There are two types of statistical identification. One is if we have these latent variables that don't exist and we assume they're normally distributed, the mean and the variance of those things somehow has to be fixed. Either we fix them ourselves or we put other constraints in the model, right? So think of it this way. You've heard of the standardized factor. We fix the mean to zero, the variance to one, and in a multidimensional assessment, then we might do that for every one of our factors, our latent variables, right? That fixing of a mean to zero and a variance to one, just remember that's a constraint on model parameters, right? We could make alternative constraints on different sets of parameters and then get parameter estimates for the mean, of the, the mean and the variance of these latent variables. It's a choice, right? It's not always that way. And the second part, so that's figuring out what the scale is, right? We can't estimate everything. And the second part of that then is how many items do we need per latent variable to be able to estimate it? So you've heard this before, right? But I'm going to give you my spin on it. And again, I'm trying to put my spin on it in a way that moves you like toward the, the, the well, I want you to be able to like read this in other like more t technical texts, basically, like moving you toward the technical side of what we do for how we do this. So how, uh, for the location and scale identification, location is sort of a synonym for the mean, scale is a synonym for the variance. Sometimes we say that. You may have heard of location scale models. This is the most basic form of those in some ways, because we have to do something with each of those parameters in that sense, but oftentimes they're just fixed. Um, but generally speaking, one type of constraint is named needed for the mean, and one type of constraint is needed for the standard deviation or variance. They're synonymous. They're not the same, but they're, one is the square, the function of the other, uh, for each latent variable, right? So if you have a four-dimensional assessment, You've got to do this, if you're trying to estimate, for instance, the factor variance in each dimension, you're going to have to make a constraint relative to that variance for all four dimensions. Cool? All right. Um, so you can use those constraints to specifically say, like, for instance, in the, high, in the standardized factor, I've got a zero for the mean. I've got a one for the variance. That's a constraint. Uh, you could also use what we would call marker items. Oftentimes in CFA class, we only call marker items for the variance, but technically, again, remember, both mean and the variance. Lisa talks about this in her classes. The mean model for the means, model for the variances, they're like two different sides of a model. The same thing occurs here. There's marker items for the mean and there's marker items for the variance. Marker items for the mean are um, put in place by putting con a constraint on, item, on an item intercept for each dimension that you're talking about. Marker items for the standard deviation or variance are specified in, uh, by putting a constraint on the factor loadings or the item discriminations, that thing multiplying the latent variable itself. You've probably heard that before, right? Cool. There are other ones, uh, like so for instance, let me talk about the marker items. Uh, actually, yeah, I'll say it now. Uh, I'm going to go more in depth in just a few pages here. Um, What's a marker item look like? Like if you want to estimate a standard deviation of a latent variable, what do you do? What do you set that loading to? One. One. Could you set it to two? Yeah. Could you set it to zero? No. <laughs> How about this? All right, so imagine factor one measures five items. Could I, I need to put a constraint on one of those loadings. Could I put a sum to zero constraint on the loadings? Where have you seen sum to zero before? In means or in linear models, right? Can we talk about certain parameters? Yes, you can. So when you think about it from a general context, not the specific I need to read somebody's paper, but from the general theory behind it, what's needed is not A1 somewhere. That's usually what you see, but it's a statistical parameter constraint, and that can be done in multiple ways. Sum to zero, 
sum to a number, sum to a constant, <laughs> become a constant, or otherwise fix the variance itself, right? But one of those is a, a constraint. It's a, a statistical constraint that we're talking about. Push. How are we doing? Same thing with the means, right? For the factor means, item intercepts, sometimes you need to fix one of those to be able to estimate the mean. We'll, we'll see a little bit more of that as we go forward. How about number of items per latent variable? What have you been told before? How many items do you need per latent variable to measure it? Three. three. What's magic about three? It's a line I'm going to disagree on the line. Okay. You have the system of equations idea, but it may not be linear. The line, the two points, but it's not that. Think of it this way, and I'm going to show this. Actually, where do these numbers come from? It's coming. <laughs> In the sense that degrees of freedom, so there are different types of degrees of freedom in different models that you look at. Okay. In the sense of the CFA model degrees of freedom, where we're talking about number of free parameters, yes. Three items in a single dimension has zero, uh, has, has exactly the right number, has zero degrees of freedom. Effectively, you are just identified. When we talk about degrees of freedom in a like a linear models context, when we talk about like sample size minus one, that is different than the degrees of freedom here. That is degrees of freedom based on where the how the mean might change. Where here a degree of freedom is with respect to a parameter, not a person. So it's a, it's a little bit different. But yes, that is that is it. So if you have a single latent variable, a unidimensional model, you need three items. If you have a model with two latent variables and an estimated factor correlation between them, then you can have three items measure one and two items measure the other. That's the bare minimum. Now, if you have a third latent variable on top of that, that gets even crazier, right? But let's be real. How many of you go around with three latent variables measuring things? Is that a good idea? What if I told you there are scientists out there in quantitative science, quantitative psychology, who say, that's a great idea. It relates to last week's class. That three item factor that's just identified fits perfectly. So there are people who will argue, have argued, oh, model fit, we need good model fit. The way that you ensure model fit, only have three, <laughs> three items. I think that's a bad argument because we do measurement for a living, right? Like I, I embody measurement, I don't know about you, if you see me cook, you should see the precision at which I try to measure the ingredients. <laughs> I'm serious, like weighing things and like, like it's funny because anybody coming to my house, if I'm cooking them dinner, they will laugh at me almost invariably. And I'm like, I'm a, I do measurement for a living, right? right? And why do I weigh things like twice? Because I need that reliability, right? And three, that three doesn't have that reliability, right? <laughs> right? Three is like, you know, recipes from my grandparents' generation, the pinch of this, <laughs> two shakes of that, you know what I'm talking about, right? A little bit of flour, a little bit of butter, it's all good, right? That's probably a bad idea. But when you look at the perspective of model fit, three fits perfectly. So I prefer model fit to be like based on the construct, but that's not, that doesn't happen a lot of times. All right, so where do these numbers come from? You remember this ugly equation from last time? This is the model implied distribution, like data distribution. This is what the data look like. Not conditional, marginal, just y, for a CFA model. Uh, and here I have specifically with three items measuring one latent variable, because I'm going to walk you down something that's in Lisa's slides in her factor analysis class, but I'm going to do it with my style a little bit differently. All right? So here, remember this from last time? The mean of it, we walk through it. The mean is. Uh, the item intercepts plus the, the factor pattern matrix. Remember, the factor pattern matrix are the loadings that are estimated and the zeros from the Q matrix sort of superimposed on top of each other, right? That's what lambda Q is times our vector of means for the latent variables, right? The covariance matrix then is factor pattern 
times factor covariance matrix times factor pattern transpose plus unique variance matrix. Right? And for this, the sake of this, this unique variance matrix is just going to have a diagonal, meaning there's no correlated residuals in this case. Right? So this is the quintessential local independence assumption that we make in a lot of our models. All right. So this is our model implied mean vector. So here, this, this quantity in the very first part of this section right here, I'm calling mu tilde because I needed a name for it. <laughs> so mu tilde is the mean vector itself, right? And that is, and I put this in, I'm going into scalar math now. I know the, the, the horror of dealing with just numbers or variables, unit single variables, not matrices, but I wanted to show this. So this right here is the scalar. Sorry, folks, on the right-hand side, I'll back up. All right, and then from the data, we know there are three Ys. Mean Y1, mean Y2, mean Y3. This is a system of equations, right? We know here, Y1 should be equal to this first component, Y2 should be this, Y3 should be that. But we have seven parameters up here and only three known quantities. And that is the problem that we have. We cannot estimate all the parameters with just three observed means, right? It's a problem. So we can add constraints, right? So for each, in this case, it's a unidimensional thing. If we set the mean factor mean to zero, our model implied mean vector is now just mu one, mu two, mu three. Now we have three means, three parameters. We have three observed means, three equations, three knowns. We are just identified. We can solve it algebraically. In this case, the means are the means of y, or will be the means of y, unless something is horribly wrong. Pardon me? Oh, shoot. Thanks. Let me make a note here. Thank you. I'll try to fix this. I try to fix my slides at night. The problem is it's at night. Oh. Okay, right. All right, let's talk about the covariant side, though, right? This is where things get really interesting. If you do the matrix product that you have there, right, lambda phi, lambda transpose plus psi, you get this for a covariance matrix. Now, this is a triangular matrix. Anything below the diagonal is reflected across the diagonal. So really, there's only one, two, three, four, five, six unique cells in it. Right. So here we have three loadings, three unique variances, and one factor variance. So again, we have seven parameters. Seven parameters. Three loadings, three variances. The unique variances, one factor variance. There we go. Seven. All right. In our covariance matrix of the data, though, where these are supposed to map onto, we only have six covariances. We have three variances and three covariances. So now we are under-identified. So this is where we need a constraint. So we can put a constraint in. For instance, if we set the factor variance to one, right, phi, we set phi to one, we have this is our model implied covariance matrix. It's now simplified, but we have three loadings. We have three unique variances. Now we have six parameters and six unknowns. This is a system of equations that we can actually fill out. Right here, all six equations, right, from each unique part. And you can do some algebra and show, ta-da, right? And here's the thing. If you want to test this out, don't take my word for it. Generate some data from the factor model, grab those covariances, try to calculate these parameters and see if you go stick that model in Lavon or M plus and get the covariances, they get the same parameters. If, it's, if the data is complete and it's three items, it should be identical, right? It's perfect, it, it fits perfectly and this is why. Any questions so far? So that's on Lisa's slides, that's just my notation for it, all right? Let's do a little bit more. What happens if we wanted to estimate the factor mean, though? We'd have to do the same process, right? We need a constraint. What if I set the very first item's mean to zero? All right. We can do that. 
Then when I have my system of equations, right? Remember y bar is what I've observed. We can show up and put this in there, what each is. The mean for the factor is now the mean of the data for the first item divided by the first item's factor loading, whatever that happens to be. So you can see, we call it the mean of the factor, but it's coming directly from the data itself. Had we chosen to put the constraint on item two, it would be very different. Had we, and this is all very different from had we chosen the constraint of setting the factor mean to zero. But these are identical models, right? It's just specified with a different constraint. It's like in analysis of variance, sometimes if you have like a one-way ANOVA, right, with a single categorical predictor, sometimes you might dummy code that, or reference code that predictor with zeros and ones. Sometimes you might, uh, what's the other one? Um, reference, oh my God, I'm blanking. I haven't taught linear models in a while. I gotta go back to it. But effect code, that's it. Negative one and one, negative one and a half and one. There's different coding systems involved. It may give you different parameter values, but they're all transformations of it. The model is identical, even if you make some di different choices. And those choices are the constraints. Here we've got constraints. How are we doing? Questions on any of this? Make sense? So I'm trying to give like the deeper dive, a little bit more of this. Now let's talk about the variance. All right. <laughs> Same thing here. What if we wanted to estimate the factor variance? Well, let's take the first item and set it's loading to one. That's one constraint. So now that first item's model implied variance is just the, the factor variance plus the unique variance for it, right? Because one squared is, goes away. Now we still have the six equations, six unknowns, and I got out my pen and paper and I did this. Same thing. <laughs> it takes a few more steps and I didn't want to type those steps into the computer, but the same thing happens. The factor variance now is an interesting ratio of what the, the products of covariances happen to be, right? Each of the loadings is now a ratio, and each of the unique variances is sort of the difference between the variance itself and the common variance. That's what these things are, common, like common variances almost. So. so it's a little bit different, but you can do the same process. How are we doing so far? This was not in Lisa's slides, so just in case you think I'm just copying Lisa, <laughs> I'm not. And by the way, if you took her factor analysis class, some of those slides are mine from like long ago. All right. Not to, not to, I'm not picking on Lisa. I'm more just afraid that you're going to be like, you're just teaching what Lisa does badly. Fair. Fine. Um, <laughs> statistical, all right, so that's. That's like what we teach you in factor analysis land, but we never talk about Q matrices there. So let's go and map statistical identification onto the Q matrix a bit, okay? You see that the Q matrix specifies the alignment of items to latent variables, but as you know, not all Q matrices are statistically or identified. So let me talk about that from this perspective right here. If I build a Q matrix, and I do this thing, whoops, five items. This is the three items measures one factor, two items measure the other. If I put a factor correlation in, this is an identified model. This is identified, right? Is this identified? How would you know? Turns out you won't. This we're, You have to use that three and two with the factor correlation to figure it out. Turns out, actually, this, I believe, is identified if you put a constraint on the factor correlation. Because technically, you have three items measured for each dimension. The factor correlation can't be estimated because of the system of equations that we have with it. But again, we're not likely to be at the, lim the lower bound of identification for most of what we do in education at least, okay? So I'm gonna grab, in general, when you look at a Q matrix, if you start looking at Q matrices, there are tens, trends that you see, and if, you're, if you live my experience, if I can give you what's in my head for the lived experience I've had with working with people trying to estimate or measure things, I can give you some 
guidance. I think that's what I'll put it in. I don't know that this is as, as theoretical as like a proof, which would be ideal, but some guidance. Uh, number one, three atoms in general per latent variable. That one case I showed you on the previous slide, uh, I'm not, my, my hand drawing is the one case, the, the limit on the low end is the, the exception. Number two, and this is a key one, all, at least some items that are unique to each latent variable. Meaning, you can't measure everything with every item very easily. Right? You think of it as design. Right? If, if you had a Q matrix and one dimension always appeared on a variable, on items, when the other one did. Right? So if I talk about it this way, let's imagine I make this a little bit more identified right here. Actually, let's do yeah, this. And I have this other dimension right here, like that. All right? Is this identified? Not really. Take a look at dimension one and dimension three. All right? That's like saying you need factor one to answer this item, and you need factor three to answer this item. And every item where you need factor one and factor three, you need both factor one and factor three. Philosophically, how can you tell the difference then between factor one's impact and factor three's impact if they always apply to the same items? Even if they have different labels. This is the interesting part of designing a multidimensional exper uh, uh, experiment. It is an experiment. You need the same ideas of experimental design here to disentangle the factors, right? This same Q matrix goes from unidentified to identified if I do that. Because at least one of the items measures only factor three. The others, it corresponds with factor one. So I get a little bit of unique information for factor three here. Uh, this item above it has zeros everywhere. That's, that's not going to fit well, but kind of a dumb idea. But there we go. That one's identified. How's that? Am I making sense? You see this, particularly when you get into the grain side. We talk, remember the grain size of the, of the, of the latent variable, the, the sort of the definitional specificity, narrow? The more narrow the grain size, where, where you're allowing items to measure more than one quantity, the more likely it is you get factors that have names like recognize. Well, it turns out to answer an item correctly using some other type of ability, the first step is almost always recognizing that you need to use it not going to work very well. By the way, this is not an advised Q matrix. This is not a great idea. I still wouldn't like that because I only have one item that separates the third dimension from the second. But you see what I'm talking about? Like you can look at a Q matrix a little bit. It's easy when I draw a Q matrix like this, but when you have a 50 item assessment, that gets harder. So let's try that a little bit though, instead of 50. There's this famous data set in the world of diagnostic models. Came from Kakumi and Maurice Tatsuoka. It's about uh, mixed number fractions and subtraction. Right? So there's the items. There are 20 items on the assessment right there. Looks like a fractions test. Very algorithmic. The latent variables that they sought to measure are these. There's eight. If those of you in the diagnostic model world have seen this data set because it's been used What's the right word? Ad nauseum? Like, just over and over again, to the part to where like, people are like, my god, no more papers with this data set. But look at these attributes, or these, we call them attributes in, in um, diagnostic models, but these are um, uh, specifically latent variables. Right? Convert a whole number to a fraction. Separate a whole number from a fraction. Well, when you look at these items, each of you could go and figure out whether you need to do that to solve the item correctly. Now that is your Q matrix. Okay. You want to see their Q matrix? Here we go. <laughs> now, this is from the DCM or the CDM package. Um, I like this. Subtract numerators, number seven. Take a look at number seven here. Ooh. It's on everything except for item 10 or item nine. What's item nine? Did I match this up? Yeah, there's no numerator subtraction here. So, that's a complicated Q matrix. Is it identified? It looks like it is. P 
possibly, it's getting me a little bit sideways on number six. If you look at number six, get to look closely, there's two ones. And it's always with seven. What's, and it's always with seven. Yeah, that's not a good idea. But if only there was some way that we could quickly summarize this. Oh, better yet. Here's, here's the coding activity Q matrix before. By the way, I just threw this in because is this identified? This is, yes. Yeah, right? We got five items for each dimension, no overlap. We sometimes call this simple structure, although that term gets used in other contexts. The other time thing that people sometimes call this, which is really a mouthful, is within item unidimensionality. So any given item is unidimensional, but there's more than one dimension on the assessment. Right? This is actually like what your example data are like. Right? Each item measures one standard, but there's more than one standard overall being assessed. Right? This actually simplifies a lot of the math. This is really easy to show this identified. Okay, so let's talk about that easy way to do it. Turns out if you take the Q matrix transpose, right? Q matrix is items by latent variables. The transpose of it, the size of it is latent variables by items. So the transpose of it with itself gives you a matrix right here where the diagonal of that matrix tells you the count of items measuring each dimension. That's really handy because now you can do a quick check with your Q matrix to see if you have a sense of identification, right? Here we go, this diagonal, there's our two for attribute six. Now the off diagonal, right? Now remember how matrix algebra works, right? You have a, a row, the, the row of the pre-multiple times, the column of the post-multiple gives you this. And the Q matrix are all binary, zeros and ones. So when an element, for an element to count, to show up in the diagonal, is the case where a row vector is multiplying itself and then summed together. So the only time you see that is when the one is there. One times one is the only way it gets added. A one times zero isn't there. Similarly, the off diagonal of this is the cross product between these. And the only time a value shows up there is if an item measures both dimensions at once. So that, that second question here, this is item six. Item six, if we were to just look at item six, or attribute, sorry, dimension six and dimension seven, couldn't be further apart in the number of items measuring them. But you also note that this one, all two of them show up together for number seven. So this is, this is an indicator. I didn't do my math homework on this, but I want to say that I want to make an argument like the, you could say the, the column rank of this be related to that, like identification, but I, I'm not there yet. So that's, I, I ran out of time this week, even though I have a lot of slides, all right? So. I could just d do this for days, right? This is my, it's my career. Questions on that, does it make sense? Yeah. The diagonal then is, can you see it again? Is it the number that you measure only that attribute by itself? That, it's the number of items that measure that dimension in total. That's, that, uh, that is by themselves, the width item, the items that only measure that and any others that appear with it. All right, so for instance, uh, alpha one and alpha seven also have a little bit of an overlap, it's, it looks. It's like. every alpha with seven except for number two. Yeah, it's bad. <laughs> All right, you want another bit of Q matrix math? If we were to pre-multiply the Q matrix by the data, first of all, what's the size of the data? Number of persons by number of items. Q matrix is number of items by number of latent variables. So the result of this should be a number of persons by number of latent variables matrix. Turns out this thing right here is a person's raw sum score. It's like a subscore. If you have a Q matrix and you want to create what we would give a classical subscore would be on binary data, here you go. Where that's useful? Uh, well, nowhere. With one exception, remember in Bayes, we had a problem uh, getting the modes of a latent variable model to line up. Like we would see um, basically uh, like two distributions, right? This is like 
lambda and this is like negative lambda, right? So if we had theta and negative theta, like there's this, this bimodality that showed up sometimes when you ran STAN with an IRT model and we were I taught you how to like generate data to fix it. It turns out if you use some scores and standardize them, that's a good starting point for a lot of latent variables because it will keep things in the right direction most of the times as well too. So that's where I use that, but that's, that's it. I'm, I'm emptying the bag of tricks I have. I don't have any more tricks after today. Uh, the other thing you could do with those sum scores is quickly get a correlation between them. So this is like a correlation between dimensions. This will not correspond identically to your factor correlation. In fact, uh, it's uh, tenuous at best, particularly if you use an IRT model. But it gives you a quick, quick reaction to it. Any thoughts on any of that? What do you think of these correlations of sum scores? Are they high? Too high? Here's the argument I had when I was in grad school with my advisors. I said, I'm going to generate data with correlated factors. And the correlations are 0.3. And all of my advisors said, no, you're not. That's terrible. Nothing's ever 0.3. And many of you may have had this argument with me that I learned it. <laughs> I learned from my people. They were right. Turns out two dimensions from the same person are almost always really highly correlated. And that's sort of we're going to tie into something we see in just a moment with another dimension, what, what we define dimensionality as. So when you see this, this is fairly standard. I mean, you see the ranges. We've got some are 0.64, some are 0.95. That's a pretty standard multidimensional correlation matrix, even if it's not the one that we would want to estimate from a model. Right? So be prepared for high correlations. Does that mean they're distinct factors? I think so. but. Other people may not. All right. How are we doing so far? Let's go back to the Q matrix. There are some identified limits to it. Uh, the Q matrix, if you were to use an exploratory analysis, and I'm mentioning them in this class not to tell you that you should. Please don't. Friends don't let friends do exp exploratory analysis. It's like drinking and driving with psychometrics. It's bad. Sorry, never mind. It's like, like exploratory analyses are like, I don't even know. I don't want to go there. Just don't. Forget the drinking and driving. Don't do that either. That's bad. We'd all agree with that. Uh, bad for different reasons. So let me just apologize for that analogy. But it's bad. Friends don't let friends do EFA, right? Part of the reason that it's bad, we're going to talk about in just a moment. But part of it is that if you already use it, let's talk about it, right? If you want to mention it, because you still see it everywhere, even if it's a bad idea. There's a form of the Q matrix that we describe uh, that has a really old name to it. It's called lower echelon form. Uh, when I was in Rod McDonald's class, he called this, uh, he mentioned this being like an echelon flag. It's like a flag that looks like a triangle and a lower form of it looks like this. But basically the idea is this. If you look at your Q matrix, you can, if you, if you estimate a model with uncorrelated factors, uncorrelated, right? the number of ones in the Q matrix, you can almost saturate it. But you have to put some zeros in to make it statistically identified. And those zeros tend to show up at the top of the Q matrix. Right? So let me just give this image right here. This is the 20 items of the fraction subtraction data. These are the eight attributes. You look at what I did here. The top right corner is a set of zeros. Now think about it conceptually what we're saying. That means item one only measures dimension one. Item two measures two dimensions. Item three goes to three, and so on until you get to where you've saturated all the zeros in the upper corner, that upper echelon area of it, and the rest of it are ones. So you're probably thinking to yourself, wait a minute, how do you know that item one only measures dimension one? Right? Well, this matrix is not necessarily built for, de for, for specification of the latent variables. This is an exploratory matrix. The number of parameters that you will estimate here is exactly the, minimal, exactly the number to just identify the model such that you will look at this. It's built effectively so that those parameters could be rotated. And this is going to touch on the, fact that the rotational indeterminacy of your model that we're going to get to a little bit later. Right? So what do I mean by that? 
right? If I built this Q matrix, I'm making a very strong hypothesis that item one measures factor one, or factor one. I don't even know what factor one is in this matrix. <laughs> what this matrix is doing is built to saturate the model with as many parameters as possible, and then for me to do tricks on those estimates to figure out what it means, right? This is an exploratory Q matrix. But the lesson in this Q matrix is not that I'm saying that item one measures factor one, it's giving you the bare minimum of what you can do with data, right? This is a confirmatory analysis that mirrors what you would do in exploratory analyses. Questions? Have you heard of lower echelon or upper echelon form? That's right, yeah, you may hear about it in matrix algebra, particularly when you talk about um, back substitution, forward substitution, triangular matrix. That's right, that's right, that's right. In fact, that's the numerically stable ways of taking inverses involve this as well. Um, but in Q matrices, it actually has meaning as well, too. How's this going? Okay, this is exploratory land down only. But hold on a second here. I told you the factors are uncorrelated. Well, that's a bad idea. But remember, with rotations, we can actually induce a correlation if we want to. But rotations are bad ideas also. The big problem with exploratory analyses is less the math and more the philosophy. Why are you exploring in the first place? Right? You built an assessment on purpose. You should use that purpose to build your assessment, your test for it. Right? So that's the bigger problem. Um, what else do I want to say? Anything else about this? All right. Oh, that's it. Right there, I got it on the slide. Thank you, Templin, for remembering this. The, the previous version of myself like, gave me the breadcrumbs that were my feeble memory forgot, but thankfully I wrote it down. Um, if you need correlations between factors, which you tend to do, you just add more zeros to that matrix. And that can give you an, the ability to estimate correlations. Um, the other thing to think about with this is maybe you have an assessment where you know a couple items absolutely measure a couple dimensions. Like you've built those items, you've built it well, and maybe you have a couple items combining them where you're not entirely sure. Well, if you have enough zeros in your assessment to do that, you can build this hybrid exploratory confirmatory model where you are basically confirming the structure of some dimension, some items, and then the other items that you don't know, you saturate with ones on their row estimate all their parameters and see which ones are non-zero. That'll help you figure out what is missing. That version of exploratory I'm a bit of better, I'm better with because it presumes that you know what dimensions those they are in the first place. You may just not know how a new item might map onto those dimensions indeed. That one's a little bit better to me. Like the, the one where you come in cold like I don't know chat GPT what are my data? Like chat G it'll give you a chat GPT style response with less like, fa like, like whenever I use chat GPT, it's always superlatives. Like, oh, yeah. Anyway. All right. So let's talk a little bit about those exploratory analyses. How many of you have done exploratory factor analysis before? Shame on you. I'm just kidding. You're probably forced to in a class, right? Um, how many of you have done exploratory factor analysis with maximum likelihood before? Okay, maybe. So exploratory come in like two forms. We're going to cover those in a couple weeks. One is matrix algebra derivations, principal components, spectral decompositions, and so forth. That is just a quirk of math. So I'm not going to talk about those. I'm going to talk about the maximum likelihood version, right? The maximum likelihood exploratory analyses don't have eigenvalues and eigenvectors, for instance. If you don't have eigenvalues, what do you have? Well, you have a model like we formed before. Well, it turns out that lower echelon form um, is just identified. Right? Just identified meaning, remember, we used that, that description with the number of unknowns with the number of known quantities in a system of equations, right? They're exactly equal. So these zeros represent parameters that are set to zero. Those are specific, specifically constraints imposed on your data, right? So in a maximum likelihood analysis, we're not doing any type of decomposition of a covariance matrix. We're actually estimating the model, sometimes in full information. But 
that we have to still maintain this set of constraints to make it identifiable statistically, right? So what does that mean? If you go to MERT and you ask it to run two dimensions, it will give you two dimensions of data, but behind the scenes, it's putting the constraints in to build it for you. It does not put a zero for one of those parameters. And if you're an M plus, the same thing happens. If you're in heck, proc factor, method equals ML and SAS, or even SPSS has maximum likelihood versions of it. Then where do the constraints come in? You have to build them. So even though you're getting a full matrix of parameters, they are subject to some really weird constraints. And it turns out, for whatever reason, these constraints are buried in user manuals. Right, so I was trying to teach this class at KU, and actually I was loaded up because I had this battle with one of the old professors there about whether exploratory analyses are bullshit, and you can tell which side I'm on. And one of the arguments I made was there's no such thing as exploratory versions, maximum likelihood exploratory anything. It's all confirmatory because you have to set the system of the constraints in to be able to even statistically identify your parameters. So I went through the manual in SAS. <laughs> like, how are you estimating this, SAS? Like, a SAS's user guides are really in-depth. Like, if you ever want to, like, learn mixed models, go to Proc Mixed and read it first, and then go and read the references, because, like, SAS does a great job describing what's going on. I was expecting that with Proc Factor. All SAS said was, we use the method of Lawley and Maxwell, 1971, so I went and I tracked down this stupid book. I had to use it in the library, but it's not a stupid book. It's quite a good book, right? And I'm digging through this 1971 book. Pages are falling out, like notes to different people, like people underlined it some back in the 70s, you know? And I found this is the constraint that they recommend. They say, oh, we're gonna estimate the model subject to the constraint such that we, if we took the factor pattern matrix, multiplied it by the factor, actually this thing, I made a typo, this should be, Unique variances, this should be psi, not phi, pardon me. Uh, and then we have the uh, other factor pattern matrix. This product resulted in the matrix delta that was diagonal. What the heck does that mean? Well, it turns out that's an easy way to ensure that the same number of zeros exist, the same constraints are there, equal to the size of the, of the model itself. So what that means is it's putting, uh, when you do, actually, let me find this real quick really disappointed in myself. This should be one letter difference, an H compared to an S. I'll quarto that thing. There we go. That's what it should look like right there. I'll repost these when I'm done. But um, this thing is an easy way to do it. But that's what's running behind the scenes in exploratory, uh, maximum likelihood versions of exploratory factor analysis. And then I'm not entirely sure what's running behind the scenes in other methods as well, but you have to put these constraints in to be able to estimate it. So what does that mean? It means if you look at your, your output of your factor loadings, there will be a, every, every, every item and every dimension will have a factor loading, but they're subject to looking like this, this form specifically. And that's crazy. It's this, I, in some of my previous slides, I actually worked, derived it. It's like putting a dome around where they can be. So that's, when I end my, my you shouldn't do exploratory factor analysis lecture, which by the way, I can never get anyone to debate me about, because I think they know. But um, I end it with, if you're using maximum likelihood or likelihood-based methods, which you should be, there's no such thing as exploratory. You get to put these constraints or those constraints. Which one's more interpretable? I don't know what this is doing. I can tell you what this is doing. So my argument about exploratory analyses with maximum likelihood is there is no such thing. Right? You still are having to make constraints. Make constraints that make sense. That would be my, my argument. How are we doing? Now if anyone's telling you that, I'd like to hear it. But if you're in your other classes, you're like, yeah, Templin is slamming exploratory analysis. I am. Lisa will say, it's not your data's job to tell you what they measure, right? I'm envisioning the case in when you like philosophically want to use exploratory analyses. Have I told you this story before? It's the one only place I got. There used to be this store, this this show called like Storage Wars. Have you ever seen it before? Yeah. 
right? Which were like where people will run around, and it actually turns out the person on that show, her name was Lisa Hoffman, with an E, spelled the same way. So this tie, this is like a personal <laughs> thing, right? So like if you, so the premise of the store, there's these storage lockers that you can pay for if you don't have enough space, you pay and you put your stuff in it, right? Well, sometimes people don't pay for their lockers. And so those lockers end up getting uh, liquidated like on an auction. And so people have to bid on the locker, lockers, usually sight unseen, and that's the whole premise of the show. Let's imagine you won a locker in an auction and there was all this data in it, but there was no labels <laughs> on the data. Nothing describing items, no Q matrices, nothing. All right, fine, use exploratory analyses to your heart's content. Great, you happen upon these data, you have no idea what they mean, fair. But come on, you know what, the, you know what you're measuring when you write a test. Exploratory analyses don't help you get there. They are built on the same constraints that everywhere else has. The, pro the problem is those constraints are well too hidden, unfortunately, in the system. Here, let me give you another for instance. So much so, and people are so taught about exploratory factor analysis that you should see eigenvalues and eigenvectors. That's the matrix decomposition version of it. All right, that's not what I'm talking about here. This is likelihood based. M plus uses likelihood based statistics, right? Because it will not, the way you can test it is you, you can't actually estimate a factor per item like you can in, in um, the matrix based decompositions. But then if you ask it to plot, it'll go and do the decomposition and show you eigenvalues. That doesn't relate to its output other than the relationship between the two methods in general. Yeah? Is this um, relative to multidimensional scaling? Uh, multidimensional scaling is a little bit different. That's a I, I, I don't know if, I, I mean the Lolly and Maxwell citation, I'm not as familiar with that, so I, uh, the trick in multidimensional scaling is, is less the methods that use, the input is a distance or a similarity matrix. And how that's formed, once you form it, that uses uh, like a, almost like a least squares to sort of minimize what they call, well, and some, there's lots of ways of doing it, but stress was the one that I learned, like minimize a loss function on that. But um, I'm not sure where the connection is, good question. Any other questions? How's the day going? Have you heard any of this stuff before? No? Good. All right. So that's statistical identification. You gotta have your model be statistically identified. By the way, all your homework should be identified, with the exception of those reading standards. All right? The homework this week I said, take the reading standards and don't assess the standard, assess the dimension, the RL or the RI, the domain, right? And I don't know if you noticed this, but your Q matrix for those reading standards don't have three items per dimension. That's why. That's why we aggregate up. So that's where that showed up. Okay? All right. So empirical identification is the next hurdle, right? Statistical identification. Statistical identification, I, I went into detail in the nuance of it because I wanted to give you the, the technical part of it. But in general, for what we do in the, the types of um, assessments or the types of um, models that we use, yeah, we, we, we're almost certain it's identified, right? Unless you're skimming the surface of only a couple items per latent variable, which you probably shouldn't do, we're fine, right? Empirical identification is whether you can make the model to converge. That's the best way of talking about it. How many of you run a model? in M plus or even Stan and it never converged. Or MERT, like in MERT, it doesn't really warn you, but it sort of does. You get the end of the number of EM cycles and you can never tell why that is. So then you go through the documentation and you're like, how many more cycles do I need to add? Okay, that goes 500, let me make it 1,000. And it gets to the end of that, <laughs> it doesn't work either. Or how many of you have run a model, it's converged and you look at the point estimates, the parameters, they look normal, but one of the parameters has a standard error of three million. Like the parameter estimate is like two, the standard error is three million. Have you ever seen that before? Like, like it starts to overflow like the column it's supposed to be in, have you? Or it switches to scientific notation. Those are indicators of empirical under-identification. 
right? Those are parameters that can't be estimated. And I'm going to give an example. This is not a sufficient example. This is not the only way it happens. But here's one case, right? Basically, two things where this happens. Latent variable correlations. Um, you need to have latent variable correlations less than one. And technically, you need a positive semi-definite covariance matrix. You need to be able to invert it. The other place where this shows up is if you have an item that's actually not measuring a factor, but you make it a marker item for the variance. Like you turn its factor loading to one. Well, that factor loading should have been zero. Let me go back up to this. I derived this up here. But that causes all sorts of problems with the rest of the parameters, right? Uh, I don't, I can't actually show it, but uh, as you might imagine, that, that turns out to be really bad, right? Um, so um, let me give you an example of where I can make it work. Um, this is our Q matrix from the first coding activity that we all built, simulation. This is my version of the simulated data. There's one difference though, my Q matrix I'm doing here, I'm actually building it where there's only one dimension. All right, and actually looking at this, I may have coded this badly. Ugh, am I transferring it over? No, I have one, one factor here. Anyway, it's not good. Either way, this is what happens. Um, here's some examples. First, I did it correctly, then I uncorrected it. The correct way I did it never converged. And now, I did it incorrectly. It converged, surprisingly. <laughs> but look at this, I get NANs. You know what NAN stands for on a computer? Not a number. Thank you. <laughs> not a number. What's not a number? Let's see, one divided by zero, not a number. Log of negative one, not a number, All right? Square root of negative one, imaginary number, that's a complex number, that exists. But log of one divided by zero, not a number, right? So this means something's going on in estimation. It's tough to, to pin down. So this is an example. What's the, the practical uh, simulation? What's the practical, when, when does this show up most commonly? Most common is you have too many dimensions that you think are existing in your data, and some of them aren't really dimensions. You're basically fitting a two-dimensional model to one-dimensional data or something along those lines. That's an indicator that things aren't working out. Uh, other indicators of it, uh, algorithms that don't converge within the default specs, posterior distributions in days that look all weird that you have to like put super tight priors on to try to clean up, standard errors that are ridiculous, I mentioned scientific notation, correlations that are super large, NANs showing up. Those are all bad things to have. How many of you have seen that before? Yeah, bad idea. All right, it's, uh, it's break time. Shall we take 10 minutes? All right, let's take 10 minutes. Ten, two o'clock, we'll be back and getting the party started again. I don't even know it. All right, okay. Actually, I wasn't over here, it was over here. All right, so next we're talking about one of the problems with multidimensionality is that, believe it or not, what a dimension is depends on the model you're using. So if, if you are sitting here saying, I'm using a MERT model, a dimension is each of the latent variables. If you're using a latent class model with three classes, is that one dimension? Because you have one multinomial variable or is it three dimensions because you have three like dummy coded categorical variables? Nobody knows, right? So latent class analysis, if we didn't have mixture models or different versions of it, dimensionality might be more straightforward, but then it's sort of weird. So there's a paper by Doug Steinle, a grad school colleague of mine, editor of Psych Methods currently, with Rod McDonald, one of my uh, mentors in grad school. Uh, and this paper shows how um, you can show with a, a clustering or a classification, a latent, basically a mixture model, that you can come up with the number of dimensions in a factor model by taking number of uh, 
plus, uh, classes plus one, or the number of factors plus one is the number of classes. So this weird combination uh, of it. Moreover, there are other papers, uh, Paul de Boek, Paul de Boek uh, in early 2000s, some of his students a little bit later than that, also showed some equivalence classes of latent class and some other models as well. What all that means though is this. When we talk about a dimension, like multidimensional IRT, that is not a uniform thing. At some point with models, what a dimension is gets fuzzy. And there's multiple ways of looking at for some models. Have you ever considered that before? So now I'm attacking the premise that you may hear if you talk about doing multidimensional assessment. Or better yet, let's imagine I hire you at my business and we are giving, giving multidimensional assessments to the world and we need to go to in front of attack at a state to describe our assessment. That's where this is important. <laughs> because what you have to do is define the dimensionality in the context of the model that you're using. And this also relates to the paper I had you read for this class as well, like what dimensionality happens to be. So, also, when you get more complicated, if we had like um, method factors or cross random effects, explanatory IRT models, we never talk about the item dimensions. There's the person dimensions, there's the item dimensions. And each one of those may be multidimensional in each dimension. <laughs> what? Yeah, it starts to get crazy. What a dimension is is hard to define. It doesn't seem so straight. So if it's hard to define what a dimension is, you, as you imagine, if someone said, how many dimensions are in my data? It's hard to quantify what they are as well, too. Um, what you will find is usually within a context of a model, so just MERT models that are very basic. We will say, oh, we can do like a likelihood ratio test potentially with differing numbers of models, different, different dimensions. Like, do I have four dimensions? Do I have two dimensions? Do I have three dimensions, right? Uh, matrix algebra based methods like principal components or any of the, um, the old fashioned like image factor analysis Alpha rotation, alpha, alpha factor analysis, like the old, old factor analysis before we had maximum likelihood, those things will give you estimates of it based on uh, scree plots, so sort of heuristic estimates, um, but they are highly unstable. Like, I, rem I think, I, you know, I don't know that we're going to go down that path, but just try generating no data where you know how many dimensions are behind it and apply a principal component and see the, the like over and over again across replications how many decisions you'd make about how many you know, dimensions you have, right? It's highly unstable. So um, finally, if you fit a multidimensional model and you have a correlation like I saw, showed you in the ma matrix before of the sum scores, the correlation matrix of sum scores, and you get a correlation of 0.85, would you, between two dimensions, two factors, would you say those are two unique factors? Would you say that there was one factor there like this becomes a debate, right? Historically, like if you think of like the old fashioned validity arguments like um, concurrent validity or discriminant validity, we want a measure to be highly related to other measures <laughs> that are supposed to measure something similar, but not so related that we're not recreating, <laughs> right? So yeah, it becomes um, difficult. That's why I like the paper and I assigned the paper this week is because the argument they, they had come up with was the use of the, the data itself, right? Now, I'm not sure I fully believe that argument, but the idea is putting it more than the statistical definition. And if I will tell you, in the times I've been in front of TAC meetings and things like that, this is one of the arguments we almost always have. And it's usually people who are like grounded in matrix algebra and very old talking about it. But it's, it's like talking to two different worlds, right? Okay. Finally, latent variable indeterminacy. I told you that was a problem. What is it? Um, latent variable indeterminacy is the ability to rotate latent variables and their factor loadings without changing the model, like the model fit, having the ident an identical model with a different solution. Now, in the in these matrix algebra-based factor analysis and principal component methods. You almost always hear about this. How many of you have heard of Verimax rotation before? How many of you have not heard of it? Okay, well maybe, maybe not. Good for, that's good. 
It's progress. How about, have we heard of uh, oblique rotations, direct oblomen or whatever, right? Have you heard of these, right? Yeah, you're all smiling and seeing it? That's part of it, right? So why that's a problem to me is, is a sort of a philosophical part. And it took me a while to even think about this because in confirmatory language, we don't talk about rotations much. But in exploratory language, we do. Now remember, in exploratory, I give you this example. You just found data in a storage locker. <laughs> you don't know what's in your data. So you fit an exploratory model that's not really useful, but you fit it anyway, and it doesn't make any sense. So what do you do? You apply rotations to it that give you the same result with a different direction until something makes sense and then you make sense out of it, right? I keep saying making sense, right? That's only the context if you don't know what's in the data, right? If you built items like are in your homework assessment, this item measures this standard. Does it make any sense to rotate then? No, you know what you've measured. You're set about to measuring it well. So even though you could rotate it, and there exist other solutions that are rotation-based, even in confirmatory methods, that rotation itself doesn't make sense. But you'll hear this, and you'll hear this as a, a, a rationale for not using, for instance, factor scores in general, let alone, but it shows up in the multidimensional context, particularly because in exploratory methods, we're asking how many dimensions we have, right? So let me give you an example. I found this on a walk this week. We defined a confirmatory model where we, let's imagine we have theta that looks like this, right? So theta is normally distributed with a zero mean and some covariance matrix. And we have our model itself. And to get this covariance matrix, we'll have a few marker items in the, the loading matrix, right? The model that I defined up here is actually equivalent to the following model. If theta had a standard normal or a, an independent normal distribution, right, with an identity matrix, right? So one's down the diagonal, variances of one, zero covariances but I have a set of rotated loadings that were built by taking the original loadings and multiplying that by the lower triangle of the Cholesky decomposition of that covariance matrix. This is identical, believe it or not. You're laughing. Is it because of Cholesky? I have to throw Cholesky in every week. <laughs> I'm gonna have like Team Cholesky on my shirt like next week, right? I didn't know that. Well, a lot of the people who, uh, who came from that era had to fight in World War II, definitely. Evidently, it was a really bad time to be alive. They, they found this out after he passed away, so like, he wasn't even in math, apparently, wow. when he came up with it. So. Well, um, ironically, uh, Alan Turing, also in World War II, hero in the British uh, intelligence service, uh, cracked the Enigma code. Uh, a different decomposition, the QR decomposition is what you use in linear models all the time, so World War II things. But um, this, this, you can show this. Why do I say that? If you think about this term and quadratic forms that I showed you last time, right? It would be, what is the, the covariance matrix of the data? It's lambda times this times phi times this transpose <laughs> times lambda transpose and this L times L transpose is phi. So you can show that it's the sense. So what am I saying with this? If you estimate a confirmatory model, you could go change the pattern of loadings to be like garbage, <laughs> but have independent factors if you wanted to. Now what do the factors mean? Beats the heck out of me. But you could. That's, that's rotational indeterminacy. That's what we're talking about. There exists a set of factors always that could describe the data exactly the same, but with different meaning. Is that bad? You struggle with that? Does it make you scared? And I'll just think of it as the multiverse theory, right? There's an alternate universe where these factors make sense. It doesn't make sense on Earth, though. In our in, uh, sorry, this universe. Earth, Earth may have an alternate oh, Never mind. Anyway. That alternate universe, this class is good. Sorry. <laughs> all right. Uh, finally, the last one. Estimation. You get through all of that. Good luck estimating this. Um, in CFA models, there's actually no problem with estimation. There's a nice um, marginal distribution that doesn't involve an integral. You're good. But as we saw last week, the target distribution in IRT with, IRT, with non 
you know, any model that contains one or more items that are not multivariate normal. One. 20 items that are multivariate normal, one discrete item. Now we've got to integrate to get to marginal distribution. That integration is difficult numerically. Um, it requires what we call a quadrature point. So we take a, a curve and we break it into a series of discrete um, regions where we tabulate the area under that region. That's per dimension. So uh, I think MERT to defaults to 61 quadrature points in a unidimensional model. But then for two dimensions, it goes down to 30. Well, that's because if you have one dimension that you're integrating over, there may be 61, but in two dimensions, now you have a grid and it's 61 times 61. That's hard, right? Three dimensions, it's now that thing cubed even higher. So putting it mathematically, there's an exponential increase in calculation for a linear increase in the number of latent variables. And that's why next week's estimation class is really challenging for me to build as to how do I compartmentalize that into something that's useful for you, right? You can dive into each. I want to give you the high points of each of the areas, but that's quite of what happens. So what are the ramifications are, um, if you wanted to use marginal maximum likelihood versus uh, with either quasi-Newton methods, which I'll talk about next week, or EM methods, um, we end up getting EM with Gibbs sampling or Metropolis Hastings. You can do numerical integration via sampling itself. Monte Carlo integration is what they call that, uh, which gives also approximate estimates. And these approximations have implications for model comparisons, for le replicability. It becomes difficult. In the machine learning world, this is normal, right? Whenever we go and uh, train a model, we're going to have a lot of different solutions and they seem to not really care about it but for us in what we do in, in our part of science this is a bad thing then there are other way, ways to do it right so this is facing that multidimensional integral head-on or getting some shortcuts to it we'll talk about limited information estimation next week which derives itself from using factor analysis on correlation matrices and those correlation matrices are built from polychoric or tetrachoric <coughs> correlations. That's the limited information that we're talking about. Um, it does not fit to the full likelihood though. And if you have missing data, the missing data ramification is when you create a summary statistic, that missing is completely at random. Whereas if you use a likelihood, missing at random. So the difference. So it's a much more strict set of assumptions on data to use limited information. And finally, the place I land on, because I, this one is nearly impossible, and <laughs> this one is shortcuts that I don't really like, I go to Bayes, and you know how, you remember Mert and Bayes last year, it was toward the end, I was like trying to cram it in, and nobody, that was where I first introduced my friend Chalesky to you, it didn't go well, all right, that's the other alternative. Bayesian methods have a linear increase in calculation for a linear increase in factors, so you can estimate things. And I've estimated models, I think I've estimated models with like three or 400 latent variables before simultaneously. Like you can do it. It takes a long time, it sucks, but you can do it, so. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, those are non-Bayesian approaches, yes. I, I, often non-Bayesian is frequentist. A lot of people say that, but I'm, I've had I've read recently some debate about the word frequentist, right? Um, the debate is in like like if you look at maximum likelihood, you get Bayes. They're both likelihood based, whereas there are frequentist people who I know last week we talked about semi-parametric. They're over there in that weird semi-parametric one. So I would say like the Bayesian method, uh, all of these have some likelihood function. The question is whether the likelihood is with respect to the raw data itself, which is full information, that would apply in the top bullet and the bottom bullet. Or the likelihood involves something that's not the full data, it's some summary of the data, and that's the middle bullet. Hope that helps a little bit. I've been sloppy in how I've worded that before. All right, other questions? So in summary, 
I made the conjecture that perhaps one of the reasons we don't have MERT in educational measurement a lot is because it's money, and that's a, probably 90% of the variance. But the other 10%, I think, is because it's really hard to do MERT well, right? I know that sounds simp ridiculous, particularly if you're used to CFA, but because of everything I just mentioned there, either from getting it to work from a model or from your data or from your design, or to getting it to be implemented through discussion of what the factors mean, there's a lot of obstacles in MERT. But, but those of you in here are worthy of the challenge. <laughs> steel sharpened steel. I'm having like, like the US Marine Corps, like the few, the proud, the multidimensional modelers. You're like the Marines, I don't even know. Those of you who are familiar with uh, the United States military, the Marines, they have this, they have this image they project in their marketing. They come join us, we're the brave, we're the strong, we're the ones that, you know, we go and do the hard work. That's you for multidimensional methods, all right? All right, just think of yourselves as the Marines. You know, I have noticed recently, this is totally off topic, but William and I were talking about this the other day, it seems like their marketing has changed. Uh-oh. In general, where now they're focusing more on, like, you get to fly drones and blow stuff up. And then like, <laughs> you're going to be strong and smart and whatever. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's totally off topic. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, and I'm not trying to drag like the military into this because there's nothing to do with the military. But <laughs> what I want, and actually I'm, I'm somewhat, well, I mean, I, I don't know what I am. I don't even need to get into that topic. What I am is irrelevant. <laughs> this is a challenge. Like to do applied psychometrics where you purport to measure something that's multiple dimensions, even if it sounds like we're, we should be able to do it well, it's a challenge. It's a significant challenge. Uh, and that's part of the reason I, my, I argue that the Fermi paradox of dimensionality is what we have it. Multidimensional models exist, but we don't see them ever. Why? It's hard and money. <laughs>